Okay. Everything seems to be working. Thank you all for being here, and most specifically, thank you for making a visit and joining us today. Um, by way of introduction, I think the easiest way to do this, maybe I look around the room and I see friends and colleagues who are involved in U.S. trade efforts with various organizations around the country, various organizations that share mission with you, that you collaborate with. So why don't you tell us first what the Trade and Development Agency does and how that's complementary but different from what the Office of the Trade Representative does, what the Commerce Department does, what the State Department does. Thanks very much, Grant, and I'm delighted to be here, and I have to start by thanking Skip for inviting me here today. It really is a pleasure, and Nikolai gave me a wonderful tour of the library today that was outstanding. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge our former director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, Mr. Larry Walther, who is back there, who... You, you may now know is the director of finance and administration here in Arkansas, so we have someone that we can continue to collaborate with. And I also want to recognize um, someone who is instrumental in getting me here today um, and is my connection with Little Rock, and that is Clark Jennings, who is my chief of staff. Um, so Clark knows everything about USTDA as well. But to your question, um, USTDA actually holds a very unique place with respect to economic development. We have a bit of a different mission than some of the other agencies. We focus both on economic development in developing and middle-income countries, but we do it also with a focus on bringing jobs to the United States. And so we do that through exports. So it's a combination of economic development abroad and jobs in the United States through exports. To accomplish that mission, we focus on areas where U.S. business is strong. And we really do believe that if you give U.S. business a level playing field, then they are going to be able to flourish. But also the fact that if you bring business together with economic development, that too is going to flourish. So we focused on infrastructure development in particular in these developing and middle income countries. As a result, the sectors we focus on include energy, and I know there are a lot of energy companies here that do a variety of things. Also transportation, and I had some opportunity to meet with some transportation folks as well, and also telecommunications. And so you may wonder, okay, that all sounds good, but what do you really do? And there are two major tools that we use. One, and I've talked to some of the members of the community about, is that we sponsor reverse trade missions. We bring people from abroad to the United States to be able to meet with U.S. businesses. So to see in action and meet with people that could provide the goods and services. An example of that was recently we had a delegation from Vietnam that was focused on renewable energy, wind in particular. And we brought them to the United States. And as a result of them coming to the United States, they ended up buying turbines from U.S. manufacturers. Now this is important, there's a lot of competition out there, as you know. So this was really a win-win situation. The other thing we do is one of the big issues with respect to people being able to get financing is the fact that they need to have really well planned out projects. And that's also what we do, is we provide grant funding to our project sponsors abroad for planning that could be used to build large-scale or small-scale infrastructure projects and with a goal to ensuring that there may be an opportunity for U.S. businesses when they do that. Again, similarly with Vietnam, with respect to this particular wind farm, we actually helped do some of the planning. And our goal there was to make sure that when the planning was done, it wasn't tilted to another type of technology, that we wanted to ensure that U.S. technology could be used, and once they saw the advantage of that, then it would go on on its own. And this was a perfect example where there was a win-win situation. Fantastic. Um, drill down, if you would, a little bit, you know, 
along those same lines, tell us a little bit more about some of the projects that you've really enjoyed working on or that you think are having the most impact. Where, and if you can, you know, what U.S. companies are you working with to give them the opportunity? Sure. And my problem is I love everything um, that we do. So this is a really hard question. Um, but I, I use an example. Um, as a matter of fact, Clark and I just came back from South Africa. And it really showed the breadth of our projects. One of the things that we were doing there was that we were hosting an aviation forum. And with that forum, it was a much broader scale and a little something that we hadn't done before. But basically what we were hearing from the South Africans, and that's one of the things our agency is very good at, it's listening. What we heard from the South Africans is what's keeping them from moving their aviation sector forward or buying U.S. products is they didn't have sufficient training. So we developed a special program focused on training, and we were there for the capstone event. So that was a very big scale type of activity we were doing. But probably one of the most meaningful things that we did while we were there is that we vi visited a project that I had signed a grant for two years before that. And two years before that, um, I signed a grant in a library in Cape Town to be able to ex extend broadband capability from the city of Cape Town into disadvantaged communities. And when we were in the city of Cape Town at the library, people were lined up on rows of chairs that would be sort of about the number that were in this room. And they were waiting to be able to use the computer. And they talked about the fact they needed to be able to use the computer for their, some of them for their business, to write a resume, to connect with someone who went to the United States. And they had come a long way to be able to do that. So what our grant would do is to provide for planning assistance to be able to bring this capacity into their townships, into their communities. Uh, well, the good news is we helped them with a plan. They implemented it. And when we were there, we went out into one of these communities where the Wi-Fi was being used. So, and with, in connection with this, U.S. companies were involved. Number of IT companies, Cisco, others, as well as South African companies. So again, everyone saw it as a win-win. And one of the sort of really fun things about this project was um, in, we went to see the Wi-Fi in a library, um, but we also just went into the community, and there's a pole, and at the top of it, there's a Wi-Fi source. And people were talking to people in the community, and we were talking about what this is. And they're like, oh, so that's why the kids come here and hang out around this pole after school. Um, so it was really great to see sort of one of our other activities involved. Um, and it went on and on. We had a, a rooftop solar, which I know we have here as well. So it really is a, a significant range. Right. Um, and, you know, I happen to love everything from the small projects to the big ones right. as well. Well, I, as I mentioned, there are people throughout the room who are working on this at various levels. And, and my friend Dan Hendricks and his colleagues from the Arkansas World Trade Center are here. And one of the things that they have been focused on for a number of years now that I, I also know is, is part of what you do is helping smaller U.S. companies recognize the opportunities that export opens to them. And you know, what can we be doing here beyond what we're already doing to encourage our companies that may be, you know, 50 people, 100 people, to explore export opportunities and to understand that there is market available to them outside of the United States? Well, I think there are two parts um, to that. One of the things is oftentimes small businesses are exporters and they don't know it that oftentimes they're supplying other businesses, and that's what they do on a regular basis. But what they don't always see is after it's been supplied, that product is going abroad. It's going abroad as part of the finished product. So I think one of the things is the natural economic development in the communities that I know that you've done so well, and I know you were part of, Larry was a part of, is extremely important to that. The other aspect is that 
USTDA, and along you mentioned earlier our other partners, um, USTDA, as I mentioned, brings U.S. businesses to, uh, or sorry, brings our, our project developers to the, the U.S. to meet with some of these small businesses. And in addition to tailoring it to specific businesses, we hold business briefings. And we invite the community to those business briefings. And we have tried to get more and more of those business briefings outside of the United States into local communities. So that's clearly one of the things we can do. Um, US Today also has a really tremendous um, website. And we've been hosting webinars and providing this kind of information and access via telecommunications to people as well if they can't make it to some of these business briefings. But we also work very closely with some of our sister agencies, and Grant mentioned the Department of Commerce. They have USIACs um, that are in the communities that are also getting out this information. We work very closely with the SBA as well. So one of the things I think that has been really tremendous is that there really has been a whole of government approach. Reaching out to small, small businesses, really recognizing that the future is really in exports. The market right now is outside of the United States, and it is one of the fastest growing markets outside of the United States. So with telecommunications, with transportation the way it is, it is open to small businesses as well as large businesses to be able to get your products um, outside of the United States as an export. All right. We're sitting here in the... Clinton School of Public Service. And so, you know, one of the things that we know is that during his time as president, and certainly every day since, um, he has spoken around the world about the fact that free trade makes us safer. I want to use that thought to segue into an area that I, where I know you guys are involved in a lot of projects, and that's in West Africa and places like that where right now, uh, you know, really since the spring of 2011, there's been turbulence and unrest. How does your work, talking philosophically for a second, how does your work in these places help to make the world safer? and actually I think helps make us safer here in Little Rock, Arkansas, although most people don't know it. Well, my mother would love that question. Um, so thank you very much um, in helping to make the world safer. But I actually think that it is something that we are doing, yeah. that really helping to develop economies abroad and also bringing the connection with the United States really does help to make the world safer that one of the things, as we all know, it's extremely important to be able to have vibrant economies, to be able to have a level of stability within countries. I truly believe that there's, there are no better models um, and peacemakers than the American people. So to be able to work in economic development where you're also bringing U.S. business as part of that, not just to sell goods and products, which is you know, part of it, but really to develop fundamental relationships. It makes a difference. Seeing those role models, seeing people from around the world, sharing those values, and being partners makes a significant difference. So yes, I think the economic development is, is incredibly significant. But the relationships, I think, also are extremely important to keeping the peace in the world. I know it doesn't feel like it to you when you're flying 30 hours in a row, um, but what you do makes the world a smaller place in a lot of ways. Um, where do you see opportunity right now that you think is either getting ready to explode and everybody ought to know about it, or you know, is already cooking, but nobody's taken enough advantage of it. Well, I think there, are, there is opportunity in many, many markets. And we talked a little bit about it today, and it may depend upon what it is that you do. But, you know, clearly there is opportunity not far away in Latin America. 
USDA is very involved with respect to Mexico. Mexico just announced the fact about a year ago that they were going to develop their infrastructure. And one of the things that USTDA did is that it developed a resource guide that took the opportunities that we thought would be very good for U.S. businesses, and there are numerous. And so it's an excellent resource guide focusing, and it's available on our website, and focusing on infrastructure projects, including um, large-scale energy projects, as well as transportation projects and telecommunications. But that also leads, we're very active in Brazil, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. Colombia, amazingly different um, than people may have thought about it in the past. Really transformation in Colombia right now. USTDA also works in, air, in economies such as China. And it is one where, you know, U.S. business needs, it's a huge market and other people are trying to take advantage of that market. So we, again, are trying to facilitate U.S. business going into China. We were just in India very recently, and um, India, as you may know, has a new government, and they're very bullish with respect to business, and they only have a short period of time to be able to prove that to be true. So now is the time um, with, respect, with respect to India. Clearly, Africa, and we can talk more about that, very um, significant opportunities, especially in energy, because of the President's Power Africa initiative. So there's significant opportunity as, as well. But you mentioned something before about President Clinton and trade. And I think one of the areas that we really have to focus on is Southeast Asia and Asia that there's a growing economy there, it's one of the fastest growing economies there, and it's extremely important for the U.S. to be able to focus on trade within that region. And it's why TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is so important, so that we have the ability to open up that market, keep that market open for U.S. business. There's, a, as I mentioned before, a lot of competition out there, and we have to have that market open for U.S. business, or other people are going to get into that market. Yeah. And it's going to be harder and harder for us to get there. And I, I, I want now to move, and you mentioned both initiatives, but let's go a little deeper on both Power Africa and TPP. Um, for those in the room who don't know the President's Power Africa initiative by heart, real quick, the headlines. The headline is that we are trying to be, bring significant megawatts um, to Africa, believing that that is extremely important for economic development, um, as well as you said, uh, peace and security in Africa. The thing that is really different about this initiative versus other development initiatives is one, it really is getting that whole of government approach from all of the agencies in the U.S. government. But the other thing that is extremely important in that initiative is that it is leveraging the private sector. So it's right up USTD's at USTDA's alley, um, but it's bringing together government programs as facilitators to leverage private sector. And the thing I have to say, it's making a difference. I have never, I've been in this, in this arena for many, many years, more than I'm going to admit here, um, I've never seen this level of engagement in Africa as is happening right now. So it is extremely important. Um, it's one that people are serious about. The other thing I think, and it's a US TDA, I'd like to say they borrowed it from us, but it's a US TDA way, um, is we're very intent on measuring what our results are. Right. And I think that's one of the great things that Power Africa has adopted. It really is paying attention to what they've accomplished with respect to bringing megawatts, bringing power to households, and making sure dollars that are expended are going to good right. use. So that's, that is Power Africa. And just to bring it home for our audience, think about it this way. We have two startup companies in Northwest Arkansas that spun out of research done at the university. One is called Silicon Solar Solutions, the other is called Pika Solar. 
these folks are improving the both the durability and the power yield in everybody else's solar panel. So as Power Africa seeks to take advantage of the abundance of sunny days, particularly uh, in uh, the northern part of the continent, um, there can be a lot of people over there building solar farms. We want technology that was invented at the University of Arkansas and machines that were invented at the University of Arkansas to wind up in Africa improving these solar panels. So there's one opportunity. The other big opportunity is it's not just generation in Africa, it's transmission. And we got a steel mill, $1.5 billion steel mill under construction in northeast Arkansas that is going to do nothing but make electrical steels for the first few years of its existence. And those electrical steels are essentially aimed at the transformer market, at the grid market. And they will be heading down the Mississippi River from Osceola to New Orleans and going on ships and heading all over the world. So w when you try and think about why what USTDA is doing in these far-flung places matters to us as Arkansas taxpayers, let me remind you that in all three of the cases I just described, the taxpayers of the state of Arkansas stand to either lose investment that they've made in these companies or make a whole bunch of money that we can then turn around and use to plow into other entrepreneurial ventures. So that's what you're doing and how it gets back to us here. Can I give that additional context and sure. thank you. I think that was perfect. But on the, on the distribution side, right. one people don't think about that right. um, as sort of a major export opportunity. But actually in Nigeria, they just privatized their distribution companies. And when they did, one of the requirements was that they were going to have to reduce the loss on their grid by 50%. Well, what they discovered that some of the losses were up to as much as 70%. So they have indicated they are going to have to spend $500 million to upgrade their grid. I want that money to be spent in the United States. That's why we brought them to the United States, introduced them to businesses in the United States. We're helping them with their project planning, but I'm hoping that your steel is going to go to Nigeria Absolutely. to those distribution companies as part of that $500 million. And so we're, you know, opening up opportunities for Arkansas companies. It, it's happening right now. Um, and along those same lines, let's talk about Asia. Um, obviously, and, and I don't think a lot of people think, particularly in, in certain parts of Southeast Asia, that from a cultural and political and security standpoint, a lot of the same things that have been happening across North Africa have been happening in, in some Asian countries as well. And so again, providing opportunity to people to make money for self-determination, for the pride that comes along with that, aids us in our quest for better security worldwide. Um, but there has been a ton of focus in Arkansas over the last few years, and it will continue. And again, my friend Boone Tan is here and others um, who have been very, very focused on opening opportunity for Arkansas companies in Asia and also looking for that direct foreign investment back here in the United States. Um, but I think one of the things that we have discovered is that in terms of business culture, it can be a tough fit sometimes. So how do you all work to try and make sure that the American companies that you're working with and the Asian companies are communicating in an effective way? There are, there are a couple of different ways. And again, I, as we've mentioned, this is a very important market. And one of the things, and I'll take China as an example where we've helped to do some of what you're talking about, um, USTDA helped to develop cooperation programs. 
So, for example, an aviation cooperation program, an energy cooperation program. And so what these are are programs that allow us to work government to government as an umbrella, but to then bring a, be able to bring in U.S. businesses under those, that umbrella to be able to work within those countries. So, for example, the aviation cooperation program in China has several different working groups which allows U.S. businesses to work alongside some of the government officials in China. A lot of this is, and as, as you alluded to, it's about people. It's about relationships. It's about giving people the opportunity to meet people and then to be able to do business. Right. And so these cooperation programs that we have in China, we have in India, um, are allowing U.S. businesses to be able to develop those close relationships. And it's the same thing we do with respect to our reverse trade missions right. and bringing people to the United States. We also host workshops abroad, and we, one of the ones that we just finished. And again, it's bringing people together, introducing technology, but it's really doing it in a human way that I think makes the difference. Again, back to, to Asia and those cooperation opportunities that you all are creating. Um, one of the things that, that we found, and Boone and Dan have been through this with us a number of times, is you know, these relationships, which power everything in certain cultures in, in Asia, um, sometimes take years and years and years to build. Um, and it delays progress. I mean, there can be people on both sides of the deal saying this has got to happen, but it's breaking through to that moment of trust. And is that really what these uh, cooperative projects are about? Absolutely. And I think one of the things, as you said, it takes years and years and years. Um, but what we've done is we've provided a consistent link with respect to these cooperation programs, which allows us to be able to bring in new companies. Right. So it was very interesting, again, you know, with respect to one of the cooperation programs, where the host country had indicated to us and the U.S. business that they, you know, years ago had not felt as comfortable sharing information. Now we sponsor a summit, and the host country comes with the information. Right. Because of what we built, they're willing to share with other American companies as well. Right. Um, I traveled to Taiwan last summer on behalf of the state um, and found a, a very different market beginning to emerge in that part of the world from what I had seen the first time Governor Bibi and I had been to China in uh, I, know, I guess that was 08, 09, something like that. But when we had first been to China, it was made very clear by everybody we spoke to that it was still very much a pick-a-side sort of environment. You know, you're either going to do business with them or you're going to do business with us, and if we catch you talking to them, you're in trouble. Um, in about four years... When I was there, they said there are, what, 900 flights a day now between Taiwan and cities on the mainland. And there are companies, and I know because I met with them, where the C-suite resides in Taipei, and everybody who's actually building anything is building it on the mainland. And I came back from there convinced that there may be a way to further the collaboration with Chinese mainland businesses working through Taiwan, which I didn't think 10 years ago would ever happen. So what are you seeing in terms of the development between those? Well, this is one I'm going to have to leave in your hands, okay. actually, um, because it is one of the things about being in a federal government agency that we do sometimes have, you know, restrictions for we can and cannot work. Um, and since we work in developing versus high-income countries, right. um, 
I'm going to have to leave you as the expert on this one. Well, and, and I don't know that I'm an expert. I'm just seeing something that I didn't see before. And it intrigues me because so many of the barriers fall down when you're in an office in Taipei. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the guy you're meeting with walks in and sounds like he grew up in West Hollywood. And you say, where are you from? And he says, oh, I'm from here, but I went to Stanford. Okay. You know, <laughs> and, and that is <laughs> things just start happening a whole lot faster. That's huge. And I think the other thing with respect to when we're talking about developing relationships and one of the things that the agency has done with these cooperation programs is also focused on training. Right. And it was interesting, we were talking a little earlier with some of the people in the community and that's the other thing you wouldn't really necessarily connect and say, you know, how do you get exports out of training? But you really do get exports out of training because if people are trained, with respect to the certain types of equipment, et cetera, that really can make a difference of what their choices are in the future. And it also makes a difference, those relationships make a difference. They, they stay um, in contact, they're gonna buy other things in the future. So I think that's another way that we've helped with those relationships that you've right. talked about that are so valuable. And certainly, um, those opportunities are very apparent to us here in Arkansas. Workforce training has catapulted in the last few years from an issue that everybody knew we needed to face but nobody really wanted to talk about to one where we've now sort of ripped the band-aid off and are looking for real solutions and and I think that to your very point some of what we're finding is that the best models for some of these things exist outside of the United States and we need to be reaching out to allies and to folks in other uh, economies and saying, okay, you know, you're turning out welders faster than we are, how are you doing it? You know, and, and really look for those opportunities to take America's training strength abroad and to source great strength to bring back here. And I think, you know, one of the things that I get very concerned about is, again, I think we have some of the best technology, we have some of the best goods and services, and if, that techno if those technologies and goods and services are going to go abroad, I want to be sure they can be maintained. Because it's not good for our reputation if a product goes abroad and then it's not maintained and they think it's broken. So this training is incredibly important um, to be able to maintain the integrity with respect to our goods here in the U.S. Right. Well, and as a for instance, we will have um, right next to the new steel mill up there, SMS CMAG, which is one of the globe's largest industrial equipment manufacturers, is going to be bringing a ton of people and creating a service center because we've got two of their biggest customers within 45 minutes of one another. They're servicing people all over the United States. Interestingly enough, they're going to start doing it from OCL, Arkansas. Um, and again, another great opportunity to bring, you know, the experts in this technology and say, come here, collaborate with us. Let's teach us how to maintain your equipment and make it better. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the sorts of opportunities that that kind of work is generating here at home. Um, how are we doing? Oh, we've got time. Okay. Well, let me jump in with something Please. because as you were talking about the training and just a little twist on that. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that USTA tries to do is listen. And listen to our host country partners, U.S. business. And one of the things that we heard um, over and over again was we really want to see more Americans. We really want to buy your goods, but they're too expensive And from our host country partners. And what we heard from our U.S. partners was that we keep losing bids because they keep focusing on low cost. So we scratched our heads a little bit and said, you know, one of the things that is really important is if you really focused on the value of a good over time, what you would discover is in most cases, actually, the U.S. good is a better, is a better value. And it's life cycle costing, which many of our procurement officials do throughout the United States and businesses do. 
but a lot of other foreign countries were using sort of just basic low cost. And as I, I keep saying, when they say that it's cheaper, I say cheaper is not paying for it twice. So we developed a global procurement initiative focused on best value where we are partnering with GW Law School that is focused on procurement, where we do specialized training for procurement officials to basically help them do this analysis and basically provide a roadmap so that instead of just buying the low cost piece um, or goods and services um, from the other side of the ocean, that they can do the value which would permit them under their system to be able to buy U.S. goods and services. And we do this, you know, where we see opportunities, where's the, where there's a tipping point, um, and it really has been embraced. And the international development banks all have their procurement rules, and they actually came on as collaborators with our program. And as a matter of fact, right now, the World Bank is looking to adjust their system right. to look a little more like this. Um, and they've been attending our training sessions. We just had our folks at the Asian Development Bank. The Asian Development Bank sat in at what we were doing, and they're looking to adjust their systems. Um, so basically, this is beginning to have an impact with respect to the other lenders and how they make their, their decisions, which I think really can open up opportunities for U.S. businesses. Jumping real quick, because you, you mentioned something that is relevant, and unfortunately we've lost Larry. Um, talking about development banks and your experience with them. Um, clearly, and, and we introduced Larry at the beginning, um, you and I have also spoken about a very dear friend of both of ours, Maria Haley, who, who as I think everybody in this room knows, had my job before I had it and was my mentor. Um, also worked at XM. Um, from my perspective as a former director of AEDC, I can tell you I see how XM works for the good of Arkansas companies. Um, but, you know, right now there are questions in Washington about the future of XM. And we have members of our delegation who have, are having to sort through those questions. Is there anything you want to say about any of that while you're here? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, absolutely. 100% support of Exxon Bank. It is an essential player with respect to U.S. business abroad. There is competition, as I've mentioned. Other governments are providing assistance with respect to their corporations. It is Exim Bank levels the playing field for U.S. business. And as a matter of fact, there are other countries that right now are taking advantage of opportunities. And I think you'll probably hear from Fred Hochberg and others. You know, example would be that China has provided in two years as much funding as Exim Bank has in 80. So that's the level that's out there. That's the competition. And to get U.S. businesses into these markets, we need Exim Bank. And to tie it back home again for everybody who's sitting in here, the steel mill I talked about is being financed by the German version of the Exim Bank. And that's where the money came from to do all of this besides what we put up. We actually leveraged the Germans to give us another $1.2 billion by putting up the $100 million that we put up. So these projects are going on right here in our backyard. And I will tell you, in traveling um, around the world, I've been talking to people who are saying that they are looking to source from other countries than the U.S because they're concerned about Exim Bank's future. So even having this level of uncertainty is costing U.S. businesses. There we go. All right. Um, sticking to the headlines for a moment, because in the interest of full disclosure, we had dinner together last night, and I think the conversation around many dinner tables in Arkansas last night was the events yesterday in the legislature in 1228. Uh, recognizing that this is an issue that people around the world 
have very, very, very different long-held culturally traditional beliefs on. What I really wanted to ask is, in terms of freedom, which is one of the things that all kinds of people tell us is what we really try to export around the country. We have, a number of us have been saying for weeks and months now, get this right or it hurts us. It hurts us in the world. It hurts us around the country. What do you think? I'm going to take uh, my federal government hat off. So this is off the record. Um, this is me as a person and a global citizen. And um, I do have to commend you for your uh, views on this. And I think, you know, there has been a demonstration from U.S. business. I think U.S. business spoke um, with respect to sort of the importance of getting this right and what the world view is. And I also have to commend people who will hear that and do something different, change right. their mind. And that's hard for people to do. Um, it's sometimes hard to take a position and then realize something else is right or what's needed in change. And so I commend those people as well. But as a, as a worldview, I think you, you've heard from the business community, you've heard from others, sure. and that's my personal view, not the federal government's. But I'll also say, you know, and the one thing that I, I have worried that gets lost, and, and Governor Hutchinson and certainly Jeremy Hutchinson in the last 24 hours have spoken incredibly eloquently about this. There, there is, to some absolute important degree, you know, a component of this conversation that we're having that says, what is the appropriate place for religion in the country, and how is it going to impact public policy and our relationships to one another? And, and I think the fact that we can have a conversation about that in the United States, and that everybody can weigh in, and knock wood, so far, nobody's gone to war with anybody over this, it is a huge demonstration to a lot of the markets where you do most of your important work that in order for an economy to work, you got to have basic level of respect for other people and their rights. And if we're going to be, as you've put it, exporting technology, and more than technology, exporting, you know, our philosophies and, and ways of doing business around the world um, is, you know, showing that we can have these conversations, important work to be done here. No, ab absolutely. And I think, you know, having the conversations, the freedom of religion, but also what we demonstrate with respect to transitions with respect to political parties um, in the United States is something that, you know, is looked at around the world. Right. Um, so I think, you know, being able to have conversations over politics, religion, right. um, around the dinner table, yep. as my, even though our mothers told us not to, um, is something that's very special. We were having a conversation last night about Nigeria, which is one of the areas where they do a ton of work. And, and if you've been following it all, they've just had a, an election that turned out differently than everybody thought it was going to turn out, um, which is always interesting and exciting to see. But one of the things that your work does and that these cooperative programs and other things do is send the message that, hey, after this election, these things they're still going to be here. You know, these companies are still going to be here doing business, and we're still going to run this thing. And it may be a whole different set of people around the outside of it, but this is how you provide stability and continuity inside of your capitalist system. All right. Can I throw in, I, I know we're going to do um, questions, but I do uh, want to throw in one thing, because it is very topical. And we chatted a little bit um, about it before, but I do want to go back to the trade agreements. Yes. And the importance, especially of this upcoming trade agreement. There are some very big 
players, one very big player in the room, um, who you know clearly could dominate that market um, if we do not open it up for U.S. businesses. And I think it goes back to a little bit of your comment about values. I think the other thing about this trade agreement that is extremely important is the desire to get it right and that it would also provide for certain safeguards with respect to workers' rights, with respect to the environment. So it's not just an agreement with respect to goods, which is extremely important. This is really an important agreement with respect to values, what it is that we find is important, um, what we want to see around the world, and how we could help in that. Right. And it's also good for jobs in the United States. Well, and along those lines, real quick, and you've talked around it a little bit, but I don't think it's possible to talk about that trade agreement in that part of the world without really talking about IP and the law for a little bit. Um, are we making progress? Are the companies that you're asking to go over there and get involved and do work able to do so, feeling like all their stuff's not going to get stolen and <laughs> sold out from under them? I'd like to say we're making progress. Um, it's one of the reasons, again, why it's important to be at the table. Right. And it's important to be able to have a vehicle to actually enforce. Right. And I think that's the other thing that we really need um, to be, and why we need some of these agreements is because it gives us a vehicle to be able to enforce. But I will say, and you talked about smaller companies, um, depending on what markets people right. are going to, I would tell them to be very careful. We have not made as much progress as we'd like, right. um, but we need we need agreements and vehicles by which we can sure. we can influence this. Absolutely. Well, we also need the opportunity, and and for as many American companies who have explained about being knocked off or complained about being knocked off, you know, there are a whole lot of people who have improved their business practices and made a whole lot more money by allowing the various folks over there to knock off their stuff and then figuring out how, you know, wow, they made it twice as cheap and just as good. How'd they do it? <laughs> but the other side of that um, is the more economic development there is yep. in host countries, they're getting a little annoyed about their stuff getting knocked yep. off. Um, yeah. So by virtue of the economic development that's happening, some of the pressure's coming from within these countries right. to say, I don't want my stuff stolen either. Right. So, you know, there is a side benefit to that as well. There we go. All right. Well, with that, shall we open it up? And uh, we've got microphones, so if anybody has a question, raise your hand. Questions at the back, right here. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Nuri Dean, a first year student at Clinton School, and uh, you mentioned how much it's easy for you to communicate to folks who studied here overseas whenever you're negotiating uh, to bring businesses into their countries. Well, I'm about an hour away from Nigeria, so I'm very excited about what's happening there. And uh, Nigeria is currently the number one economy in Africa. So I'm wondering, how do you make use of students like us who studied in America to help facilitate that easy access to the markets in our countries to make them a better place for us? Well, I was going to say, there's a real combination of things. Um, one, you should come meet our, general, our, our current deputy director, who's from Nigeria. Um, so one of the things we do is we hire people. Um, but the other thing is exactly that. I mean, Niger uh, Nigeria is incredibly entrepreneurial. Um, the work that's going on there is really phenomenal. There are great opportunities both in the United States with a number of private entities that want to do work there, um, as well as government entities. And also there's a great deal that's going on in Nigeria to be able to make that connection back um, to the U.S. I think one of the great things about the Clinton School that I'm hearing about are the sort of internships and the focus on, on the work opportunities and I think that's another great opportunity as well. Yes, yeah, Steve, back here at the back. Is there a tension between the goal of increasing exports, particularly to developing countries, 
and helping those developing countries build up their own infrastructure and industry and so forth so they can provide uh, the goods and services themselves? It's a really good question. And one of the things that we do at USTDA is it's always sort of a significant balance that we aren't, we want to be sure that whatever we're doing meets the needs of development and is what the host country wants. It's not what we're imposing. Um, at the same time, we want to ensure that there are opportunities for U.S. businesses. Um, what I see right now is that there is a lot of opportunity um, for both. And again, what I would prefer to see is host country opportunity and U.S. business than host country opportunity in some other country as well. But it's a balancing act we do all the time, and one of the things we really focus on um, is ensuring that we bring additionality, that it's, it's what host country wants, but it's also something extra that we can bring to the game. Yes, Ramirez. First of all, uh, thank you for visiting with us, uh, to both of you. My name is Ramirez Biddle. I'm a second year Clinton School student. I'm also uh, intern for the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, so Mr. Tennille, we miss you over there. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you, brought, you all are here because uh, I'm studying international relations and U.S. foreign policy, and I see where economics will be the driving issue globally in the 21st century where military power was in the 20th century. Um, so with that being said, with the thickening of global ties, uh, rural America kind of feels left out. It feels like this is moving away from, the, 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 they feel like that they are missing the boat here. And so I want to know uh, what policies should state and municipalities use to uh, to put them in the best position to participate. And also some of my uh, international friends and connections, uh, they would like to participate in the U.S. economy, but they often miss middle America. They look, they look at the, the, the coast, and they see that the coasts are too expensive. So how can we leverage um, cheaper, uh, well, cheaper, not the right word, but less costs of rural America for them to, for international companies to come in and do business and create jobs. Do you want to start? I can start. I, I think that the real answer to your question is so multifaceted that we could sit here all day and talk about it. But let me tell you about a couple of things that we were talking about earlier. And I don't see my friend Jerry Jones here, but I think that what we were told earlier about the areas they're focusing in are the right areas both for some of the developing countries they're working on and for rural America. Transportation, telecommunications, and energy. Um, the center part of the United States right now has a pretty profound opportunity available to it because of the discovery of you know, the technology that unlocks access to a ton of cleaner burn and energy than we've ever had before. One of the things that we've been working on and talking about in Arkansas for the last couple of years is how do we turn the fact that we have all this shale gas into more development here rather than just putting it in a pipe and sending it down to the hub and then buying it back essentially from ourselves. Um, but transportation, another key driver, you know, connecting parts of, of rural America to the places where the people live. And one of the things we've always tried to do in Arkansas is use our highway dollars under the theory that the vast majority of the money's got to follow the cars but that you've got an obligation to make investments in other areas that, but for the fact that you're going to take them a good road, nobody can accomplish anything from a commercial standpoint there. 
And then the third one, and this is the one where I think we've got the opportunity to make the quickest impact on a global basis, and we talked about this today, and I'll, I'm not going to steal your line, but you've got to tell them the story about the guy who, who waved at you outside the car, because this is the, the answer to your question. And, and I have another one to go with that, but um, telecommunications is clearly going to be change the world. And um, what we were referring to was that when I was um, traveling around and I had a driver who, you know, showed me his phone and said, this has changed my life. Um, and I'm like, how is that? And he said, well, you know, before I would have had to take you to where you're going and wait for you to be able to come out. I would have been tied up with you all day and it would have been one fare. Now I can drop you off. I can go pick someone else up. You can call me. I can come back, et cetera. So technology, telecommunications definitely um, is changing the landscape. But the one thing that isn't sort of a uh, dominant focus at US Today, but one um, that I think people can't forget about the value of agriculture and food security. I cannot tell you when I come home how happy I am to have a salad um, and to be able to eat whatever I want um, in the United States because of how we grow things. And I think we have all of these things are extremely important, but food security is also extremely important. And I think we can't forget about the fact that, as we said before, we have these inadvertent exporters. Um, People involved in agriculture are also extremely important with respect to exports, and they're, they're going to be increasingly ex important in the future. Right. Well, and we, as we so often do, very proudly told you today about the fact that aerospace is our number one value-added export. Nobody knows that, blah, 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 blah. To your point, what we don't say enough is when you combine our agricultural exports together, it dwarfs everything many, many, many times over. When you talk about timber, food, everything else, fiber. Um, and, you know, that goes along with the thing that I have said over and over and over again when I was at ADC, which is we really ought to be thinking real hard about whether we pour concrete over good delta farmland in order to put up metal buildings to give people eight dollar an hour jobs. It's a bad trade. What we need to be focused on doing is building that sector with food research, with prepared foods, so that we're not just taking raw soybeans and putting them in a barge and shipping them out of here. Taking raw rice and putting it in a barge and shipping it out of here. That's what all of the countries where USTDA has been working, that's how they have survived for many, many years. And we're kind of in the same boat. What we've got to do is start add and value add on top of the things we already do well. I mean, we grow food and fiber in part of our state better than anybody on planet Earth. Let's figure out how to add value to those products so that we can employ more our Kansans doing it, which is the exact same message you're sending to Nigeria and every place else you work. One more question. Abby. Uh, thank you. I'm Abigail, international student of the Clinton School. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you think the emerging of the, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank recently. Uh, you know uh, for sure the cooperation is still needed in the future by each other, but this competition is happening and uh, the U.S. government hasn't responded too much about this, so how do you think? People at the Clinton School are very well educated, it's clear. <laughs> um, and the U.S. hasn't taken an official view uh, with respect to the, um, the Asian Development Bank. But I think one of the things it really has tried to do is to encourage more investment with respect to the development banks that already exist. And the fact that there are sort of rules and regulations that have been established with respect to those existing development banks. So that has been very much their focus instead of the creation of a new bank. Let's, uh, let's thank Lee and Grant very much for being here. And those of you individually, 
continue the conversation. Thank you all.